We made this film in the town of Fokwela in the Republic of Liberia on the west coast of Africa. Fokwela lies deep in Liberia's interior, 150 miles from Monrovia, the capital city, and 27 miles from Bonga, the county seat for Bong County. All but a fifth of Fokwela's 2,000 people belong to the Bella tribe. The Bella are the largest of the 12 tribal groups that make up most of Liberia's population. I've done all my anthropological fieldwork here in Fokwela, a modernizing bush town in the Liberian rainforest. This film shows events as they actually happened in the lives of the people here. Fokwela's local government is headed by a town chief. Serving under him are eight quarter elders, each of whom heads a residential quarter. Fokwela and several other towns form a district called a clan, headed by a clan chief. Two clan districts make up a larger unit called a chiefdom, headed by a paramount chief. So Fokwela townsmen have four kinds of chiefs. Quarter elders, a town chief, a clan chief, and a paramount chief. The chiefs, like their followers, are farmers. Unlike them, they are prosperous farmers. Such prosperous men don't live in the mud and thatch houses of ordinary folk, but in houses with corrugated iron roofs and cement-washed walls. These prosperous men have large farms, are more likely to raise some cash crops, and to own some cattle. Folkwell is unusual in having cattle. Most Liberian villages do not. But these cattle create conflict and tension between the ordinary farmers and the more prosperous cattle-owning farmers. Dapu, like most Fokwela townsmen, is a plain farmer, as is Lopukwela, a medicine man. Yapbaolo Kaapbang is a young farmer, but Suakwela Jiao is older, a well-liked elder in his quarter. These men are plain farmers. They raise chickens and some goats, but none of them owns cattle. Fulquella's farmers work hard. Many rise before dawn and leave the town as the sun comes up. They practice a type of agriculture called slash and burn agriculture. This involves bush fallowing, where an area of the tropical forest is cleared to make a farm. That year, a crop is raised, and the next year, the farmer shifts to a new site. Rice is the main crop and the staple in the diet. A stew of vegetables or greens cooked in palm oil and flavored with red pepper is eaten poured over the rice. Meat is not plentiful, but sometimes the stew contains wild game, fish or chicken, or even less often, goat meat or lamb. Beef, the people call it cow meat, is rarely available and is a great treat. At mealtime, women prepare rice for cooking by hulling it in a mortar and then using a winnowing tray, called a rice fanner, to separate the light shaft from the heavier rice grains. Among the Bella, rice is used in important ways. Anything which endangers the rice crop raises anxiety, fear, and resentment. Fokwela cattle sometimes eat growing rice. This makes the cattle a source of anxious feelings because they may undo a farmer's months of toil. The town's cattle are the progeny of a herd started by Dolo Kanpe, the deceased paramount chief. They are owned by Fokwela's more prosperous farmers, including several chiefs. One of the prosperous cattle-owning farmers is Carboy, the town chief. Another cattle owner is clan chief Samuel Pei, the son of the former paramount chief, Dolo Kenpei. Like his late father, he sometimes sells one of his herd for cash income. 
His brother, Joseph Pei, a school teacher, is also a student at the University of Liberia. Sometimes he sells a cow to pay his tuition. Eleven years ago, when Delokan Pei was alive, the area containing his houses was fenced. The fence was not to keep out cattle, but to mark the boundaries of the chief's compound. Every two or three years, Folkwella townsmen representing each of the eight quarters would repair and renew the fence. Small deputations came from other towns in the chiefdom to help with the job, which took two days. As a reward for the hard work, Dolokan Pei slaughtered two cows from his herd to feast the workers. This is one of the ways in which chiefs use cattle. Feast reward constituents who meet their obligations to the chief. At the Paramount Chief's compound, the cows were butchered and cooked. Wearing his black American-style hat, Dolo Pei actively supervised the dividing of meat and rice into portions for each of the eight quarters of the town and for the delegations from other towns. Men from the various quarters and towns ate separately. Later, Dolo Pei explained the significance of the fence building and the feast. A chief must be as a father to his people, he said, and a father must feed his family. At the end of the feast, he washed his hands, knowing that he had used his herd wisely to carry out properly his duty as chief, to bind his people to him. Fulquella cattle are not fed, they forage. They eat scraps of unattended food. They also leave the town, often in the pre-dawn hours, to go to the farms to eat the rice and vegetables. Folkwella's farmers have taken measures to keep the cows from the crops. Stiles are built across the footpaths which go out to the farms. Careful Bella farmers build fences around the farms to keep out goats and small wild animals which ravage the crops. But Folkwella farmers say they build their fences primarily to keep out the cattle who are more destructive than the small predators. In the many hours they spend building the barricades, the farmers think angry thoughts about the cattle whose appetites cause such heavy labor. Folkwella people say that the gate across the motor road keeps the cattle from using the road as a route to the farms. Eleven years ago, when Dolo Pei was alive, some farmers who hadn't fenced their farm found their rice crops eaten by a marauding bull. The angry farmers chopped the leg tendon of the bull, Dolo Pei's largest. The two young men thought to be guilty were temporarily jailed. Paramount Chief Dolo Pei asked an elder, Talkalong, the father of one of them, to find out who was really guilty. Talkalong gathered a group of elders to discuss the case. This case was serious. The chief said that he could place his spirit inside his cattle. Perhaps the young men were not really attacking the cattle, but attempting to murder him. One of the young men had difficulty raising the $200 which Dolo Pei asked as an indemnity for the two farmers' fault in the matter. The young man's mother and a kinsman pleaded with the chief to reduce his request. Crop damage by cattle is common, but it's rare for the farmers to wound livestock in retaliation, as the young men did. Such outbursts cause strain in the community, and people remember them. This time, the tension eased when the young man prostrated himself before Delo Pei, begging for his mercy. At last, the chief accepted a reduced indemnity. One Sunday morning, we're filming people arriving for the service at Fulquella Lutheran Church. The congregation, mostly female, gathers one by one. Mata 
Pastor are getting strains to be heard over a loud commotion outside the church. Two young farmers have found a calf that was wounded by an angry farmer who surprised it eating crop rice. Everyone recognizes the calf as belonging to Carboy, the town chief. The two men take it to Carboy's house. Once again, ordinary farmers and the cattle owners are in conflict. Carboy is asked what he's going to do. This dispute, this palaver, isn't anything we can air right now, he says. There's nothing to discuss. All we can do is to call in somebody to look into it. I can't hear a case where I'm one of the parties. We'll take it to the clan chief. Carboy tells the people to put the calf inside a nearby unfinished house to shade it. He goes off to the clan chiefs. Someone has cut my calf and the people brought it to me. The tail was cut, Carboy explains. How badly was the tail cut? So badly that it's hanging off. The calf's right here in town so you can go to see for yourself. Is that the calf, the clan chief asked? Yes, that's the one. The clan chief speaks of the earlier time when his father was living and another beast had been wounded. All right, says the clan chief. I'll reach the matter to Paramount Chief Wuo. He'll probably send to the county seat for an ordeal operator and use an ordeal to find out who did this. The clan chief's messenger leaves to take the clan chief's request to the paramount chief. Carboy's anger subsides somewhat. He's momentarily content, knowing that action is underway. At the place where the clan chief and his friends are building a pavilion to dry peanuts, the discussion about the case continues. The usually affable Suakwala Jiao says nothing. Will they be able to settle the case before the ordeal operator comes? They all know that an ordeal is a ritual for supernaturally determining guilt or innocence. In the Sasswood ordeal, now outlawed, suspects drink a poison. The guilty die, the innocent vomit the poison. In the hot oil ordeal and the hot knife ordeal, the guilty are burned, but the innocent are not. The ordeal operator's ritual power works through the mechanism of the ordeal to select the guilty person. However, ordeals are seldom used in Foquella. Most disputes are settled through the use of witnesses and cross-examination. Someone else observes that the cut on the calf's tail looks as if it had been made by a hooked machete. The men ask which of the people who farm near the place where the calf was cut has a machete with a hook on the end. Perhaps, an elder says, the ordeal won't be necessary. 
Perhaps the guilty person will confess or give himself away. As the other men in Sua Kualajal measure off lengths of wood, everyone thinks about the ordeal. On the day set for the ordeal, ten days after the calf was wounded, the Paramount Chief arrives and we're almost out of color film. We use black and white. Wearing his Hamburg hat, Paramount Chief Hua walks through the town to the clan chief's compound and past Dolo Kenpei's grave. The men sit on the porch talking about the case. In honor of the special nature of the occasion, the clan chief presents a goat to the Paramount Chief. This is to welcome him and to thank him for the special interest he has shown in the case by sending for the ordeal operator. The gift of meat expresses hospitality and loyalty. Cattle are used in the same way to express hospitality and loyalty to the most important political figures like the president and vice president of Liberia. When used in this way, the chief's cows are a source of prestige for all the people in the chiefdom. the men's mood becomes more relaxed. They wonder what the film will look like. Your picture will go all the way to America, the clan chief says. Sure, says Wuwa, so will the goat's picture. They begin to talk about the ordeal. The clan chief has ordered the men who farm near the place where the calf was cut to stay in town to submit to the ordeal. The ordeal man is already in town. He arrived night before last. The men leave to go to Carboy's place where the ordeal will be held. Wearing knickers and a pith helmet, the ordeal operator arrives with his interpreter. The ordeal operator, David Cannabo, is called, respectfully, Old Man David by the Fokwala townsmen. He's certified by the central government as a licensed ordeal man. He's a member of a distant tribe, the Crown. The old man uses a younger man, Matthew Kennedy, as his clerk and interpreter to translate for him, although he understands and speaks Bella well. The mystique of his office is enhanced by the fact that he uses an interpreter. People from all over town have gathered for the ordeal. The calf has died. Who has been daring enough to chop it, they wonder? Will the ordeal catch him or an innocent person? What will the chiefs, who are also cattle owners, do if the guilty person is found? Old man David orders the clan chief's messengers to start a fire in the doorway of the unfinished house where the wounded calf died. He'll use the hot knife ordeal. Bella called the old man's paraphernalia medicine, not in the pharmaceutical sense, but in the supernatural sense. They're objects with supernatural power, which if properly used by a person with the requisite knowledge can bring about desired results. The most important of the objects in David's paraphernalia is the knife. It will be heated in the fire and held against the skin of the suspects. The innocent will not be burned. The guilty will be.
The old man makes a magical gesture around the fire. Again, he makes a similar gesture. The knife is ritually prepared. The old man places a bracelet made of an inner tube to which is tied a feather on his wrist. In the ordeal, the old man will rub his leg with the various magical substances and with water from the bucket next to him. Next, he will repeat the procedure, rubbing the various substances on the leg of the suspects. He'll rub his leg and then theirs with the hot knife. The Paramount Chief has selected a man to represent Folquella. The aim is to decide first whether or not the person who slashed the cow is a resident of the town. If the man representing Folquella is burned, this will mean that someone from Folquella is the guilty party. If the proxy is not burned, this will mean that the guilty person is a resident of some other town. When the proxy steps forward, the old man will address him through Kennedy, his interpreter. If it's a Folkwella person who cut the cow, this knife should catch you, the old man says. But the ordeal should not catch you for other things. If you have a witch backing you, a big fetish backing you, or anything else magical backing you, the ordeal should not catch you for that. But if it's a Folkwella person that cut the cow, then the knife should burn you. The Paramount Chief says, if you know anything about this wounded cow matter, don't move your leg from there. Magical gestures with four red feathers emphasize the chief's words. David strokes his own leg, then the proxies. There, says Carboy, he's burned. A Folkwella person slashed my cow. Test the suspected farmers one by one, say the chiefs. Wait, says old man David. There's a man who came to see me last night. His name's Suakwella Jow. Ask him what he proposed when we were all alone. Be quiet and listen, the paramount chief shouts. The old man's telling me something important. You children, get back. 
Sua Kualajau, where are you? Come forward. Kennedy interprets for old man David. The old man says Sua Kualajau came to him last night. Jiao said, I want you to help me. I'm the one who cut the cow. Then he offered the old man two dollars to use the ordeal to show that someone else was guilty. What? exclaims Paramount Chief Hua. Who in this town is such a slave that the old man should take the palaver from your head and drop it on theirs? No one, murmurs Zhao. Perhaps you want the ordeal to catch me, mocks the paramount chief. Sua Kuala Zhao speaks in a low voice. The thing this cow did is too much. The way it's been eating rice on my farm is a terrible thing. His excuse is not sufficient, exclaims Clan Chief Pei. Why didn't he bring the matter to me? How can I settle my people's palavras if they don't bring them to me? You're right, says the paramount chief. Sua Kuala Jiao should have laid the matter before you and asked you to take it up with Carboy. Then you could have asked Carboy to pay Jiao something because of the rice that the cow ate. The paramount chief orders his messengers to detain Jiao until he, the chief, can determine what indemnity should be paid to Carboy. The messengers haul Jiao back and forth, holding him up as an example to anyone who would take the law into his own hands. Carboy explodes. It's a terrible thing Jiao did. Since he didn't take the matter to court, he's forfeited any claim to compensation for the rice. The crowd scatters. The culprit has been revealed. And old man David leaves, his energy spent. The next morning, the rainy season downpour resumes, and we use our remaining color film. The townsmen return to their normal routine. There's relief and satisfaction that the ordeal has worked. The supernatural principle has operated properly. For the people of Folkwell, the utility of the ordeal has been demonstrated again. Most people are confident that the ordeal would have turned out the same way, even if Sua Kuala Jiao had not confessed beforehand. We anthropologists speculate about the ordeal mechanism. Does the ordeal operator sense tension as his fingers stroke the suspect's legs? And what do his eyes, hidden by dark glasses, watch for? But the tensions between cattle owners and ordinary farmers remain. The farmers never know when their crop will be devoured by the cows, when the well-being of their families will be jeopardized. Nor can farmers be sure if this happens that the chiefs, who themselves are cattle owners, will always give them fair redress. So the tensions remain, as do the cows, and the farmer's knowledge that from time to time the chiefs will see to it that the people can garnish their rice with beef from the cows of Dolo Kenpei. <laughs> Papa, you are really a way of 